Hello everybody, this video is a little bit different from the other ones and a little bit longer as well. You may remember from my devlog number 7 that I created a new dialogue language and some tooling to write dialogues for my games. That video just presents the idea and I've got a few questions asking for more details, so in this one I'm going to show you how to use that tool in Goto. In case you didn't watch devlog number 7, shame on you. I created a language called Clyde, it was inspired by Ink but it focused on dialogues. This language supports branching, variations, variables, translations, among other things. Even though the solution is straightforward, this is just a dialogue engine. It's up to you to decide how to use it and how to show the dialogue in your game. And that's what we're going to do here in this video. So I created this simple project you can play with. I used a cool asset pack from Nichio and you can talk to different NPCs. As I'm very creative, I named them Red, Blue, Green and Mr. Pink. Hopefully, I'll be able to cover here all the common dialogue situations you may face in your game. To not take much of our time, I won't show in details how I created the dialogue box for this project. When creating your dialogue box, there are many styles you can choose from. You may use fixed box, dialogue bubbles, or even a text chat style. You can use any of these styles with Clyde, it's really up to you how you create your interface. To keep things simple in this project, I created a fixed style. I added portraits text animation and an option selection list. Check the source code for the implementation details. Now that you have the interface, you need to install the Clyde Dialog plugin. It's quite easy, you just need to go to the asset library and find Clyde Dialog plugin and the only folder you need here is the add-on folder. So after you download the plugin, you need to go to the configuration and enable it. This is going to enable the importer and it also enables the Clyde Dialog class, which we are going to use. Sadly, you can't create your dialog files inside Goto because the editor is not prepared for that, but you can use any text editor. I created a syntax plugin for Vim and VS Code, so if you use any of those, you'll get this cool syntax highlighting. It's not perfect, but it will help you a lot. So let me create the first dialog file here. I'll create a file called Mr. Pink. You may choose to have one file per dialog, or one file per NPC, or one file per level. It's really up to you how you organize your dialog. In this example, I'll create one file per NPC. Just to check if the thing's working, I'll create a simple line here, and you can see the file in here because the plugin is enabled. Now I'll go to the code and use the Clyde dialog class. So this method here is called when you click Mr. Pink. So I'm creating a new dialog by doing a Clyde dialog meal, and then I use load dialog with the file name. So by default, plugin looks for dialog files in the dialogs folder. This is equivalent to the full path, like this. You can also use this format if you don't want to have all your files in the same folder. Okay, so now that I loaded the dialog, I'll do get content that will return the next dialog line. And I'll just print to the console. Sadly, I forgot to track my mouse cursor, so you won't see me clicking Mr. Pink, but believe me, I just clicked it. So here in the console, you can see the line object. This means that the dialog's working. So now let's integrate Clyde Dialog with the dialog box. I could create everything inside the dialog box, but I prefer to leave the integration separated from the interface. So it doesn't really matter if one day I decided that I don't like this interface anymore, I, I can just change to something else. So I created here a dialog script and I'm going to set it as an autoload. If you're not used to go to an autoload is basically a singleton. It's a node that's going to be created once your game starts and you can use it from any script. So I'll create a method called start dialog that will be responsible for creating the dialog for you, the dialog object. And also this script will be responsible to pick the dialog box. So in this project, I, I have a dialog box already in the scene and I set a group that's dialog container. So this is what I'm going to use to pick the dialog box. It's totally up to you how you do this part. I mean, you could create the dialog box on the fly when the script is created, but this is kind of transparent for the dialog script. And then I created a new method that's next content that's going to pick the next dialog line and load into the dialog box. Now in the main script, the one where there is interaction, I can call the load dialog. And you can see the interface is showing like just a simple line because this is what I have in there. Okay, so now let's add extra information to the dialog box. If you saw the video about Clyde, 
you can set a speaker and other information to your file. So I use the speaker field to control uh, the portrait and the name under the, the portrait. So uh, now you, you see I'm testing with different speakers. Now I have the proper picture. Let's make this dialogue more interesting by adding some variation. Every time you talk to Mr. Ping, uh, he's going to greet you with a different sentence. And the first dialogue will be, this is the first time we talk. The second one will be, this is the second time we talk. And the third one is, I lost count. And for that one, any new interaction will be, we lost count. But as you can see here, I clicked it twice and it showed me the first dialogue. And the reason this is happening is because we are not keeping track of chains. Every time we start a dialogue, it creates a new dialogue object. So we need to save that information between runs. And in your game, you'll probably have some kind of persistence. For now, I'll just create a file here called persistence. And this file will be um, also will be a singleton. And it's just to represent like a, your, the storage in your game. And what I do in my games, I have this dictionary in my persistence that's called dialogues and I save the data per dialogue. This is internal dialogue data, it's not really data you will be dealing with. What I'm doing, going to do here is every time I start the dialogue I load the dialogue data from, from the persistence and every time the dialogue is finished I persist the new data. So now if I talk to Mr. Pink, he's going to say this is the first time we talk and then I try again, this is the second time we talk and then for there on, um, he's going to say, I lost count forever. Now that we are talking about data, let's see how we use uh, your game data in the dialogue. And so let me use an example here where uh, Mr. Pink is going to greet you depending on the character gender. So let's say if the character is female, it's going to say, hello, sister. And if the character is male, it's going to say, hello, brother. And hello, Mr. Pink. I'm passing the speakers list because then I can get information about the speaker. So in, in here, let me call it player pronoun so it's clearer what I'm trying to do. Okay, so Mr. Pink doesn't know anything about the pronoun, so it's going to tell me uh, hello there. Now I'm passing the player, the player object uh, in the player list. And if you see here in the inspector, you can see that there is some information about the object, like the ID, that's player, the character name, that's player with uh, an uppercase and the pronoun is an F for female. So this is what I'm gonna use in my, my script. Now I'll pass the speakers to the low data and I will iterate over the speaker list and I, I'm gonna set a variable that's, the, that's basically the speaker ID underscore pronoun. Now when I talk to Mr. Ping, he's going to say, hello sister. Okay, let me show another useful scenario. I'm gonna create a new generic NPC uh, file and in this file, I'm not using names anymore, I'm just using NPC and player. And now I'm gonna use the NPC name instead of saying, hello, Mr. Pink. And uh, I'm gonna use this file for all the other NPCs. Like uh, when it's green, I'm gonna pass the green object. When it's blue, I'm gonna pass the blue object. And when it's red, I'm gonna pass the red object. And as I showed you before, each one of them have a different um, configuration in there. So now besides the pronoun, I want to save the names. Now it says hello sister because the player is female and it says hello green. Blue, hello sister, hello blue. And when it goes to red, we say hello sister and hello red. Obviously Mr. Pink is still using the old file. Okay, so now let's set variables from your game code. So let's say you have this variable called location. And depending on the location, uh, they change. If the location is set, the NPC says, what are you doing here in location? Now I'm gonna create a new method called set variable, and then I set location, and blue is going to say dungeon, um, red is going to say cave, and because green is a little bit weird, they are going to say beach. So now I say, because I know that green is weird, if I say, well, <laughs> it says beach, I say, what? And then now I talk to green, hey green, what are you doing here in the beach? And then the knight says, what? But then if I talk to Blue, hello Blue, Blue says, what are you doing here in the dungeon? And Red says, what are you doing here in the cave? So the game dialog exposes uh, some signals you can keep an eye on, like variable changed and even triggered. So now I'm just proxying the signals so you can use in your code. But um, I'll show you in a minute what are the use cases for each one of them. And for even triggered, let me do something dramatic here. Let, let me kill Blue. 
So let's say uh, green is weird, right? So green says, hey, do you want blue to go away? And then the player says, yes, and done. So now you talk to green and say, hey, little green, hey, what are you doing here in the beach? Because green is crazy. Uh, and they say, hey, do you want blue to go away? And you say, yes, and then consider it done. Okay, so now let's talk about game progression. So sometimes you have this information that's relevant for the game progression, like, like blue was killed. You said that blue was killed by the dialogue. So this is relevant information for the game. So what I do usually I have this uh, persistence dictionary that keeps track what, what happened in the game. And uh, as a pattern, I define variables that are global variables, like variables that are used in my game as progression underscore something. I mean, progression is a big name. Maybe you want to use something shorter like global. When I start the dialogue, I load the, the progression dictionary to my dialogue. When a variable changes inside my dialogue and this variable begins with progression, I just want to save it to the progression dictionary. Uh, so now I'm gonna say that blue is killed as a, a global variable. And because of, I did that, now I can go back to Mr. Pink dialogue file and just like create some more interesting dialogue that considers blue being killed. If I talk to Mr. Pink now, Mr. Pink will just give me the normal dialogue. Then I talk to Green, Green is a weirdo. And then if I talk back to Mr. Pink, now Mr. Pink is aware that um, Blue was killed. However, the expression that Mr. Pink did doesn't really seem that he's sad, right? So I'm gonna use tags. You can use tags in many different ways. And I think one, one cool use case is to change portraits. So, Mr. Pink has different faces depending on the emotion. Actually, he's the only one implemented. Let me go back to my dialogue script. And uh, because this uh, speaker info is becoming too big, I'm gonna refactor and move it to another method. Now what I'm gonna do is, if the content comes with tags and the tags uh, has sad, I just set the portrait to sad. This is a very simplistic way of doing that, but it works. See? See now? Now he has a sad face. Now there is another problem with my dialogue. Uh, when the weirdo green asked me if I want blue to go away, I don't really have the option to answer no. So let's fix that because maybe you're a good person and you don't want blue to go away. So if I say yes, then, then blue is, is killed. If I say no, then PC is just, okay, I see, next time then. Yeah, and then this should be enough. And let me go back to the code. The problem is actually my code is not prepared for that. But so what I'm gonna do is again, a little bit of refactoring here. Uh, when the dialogue's finished, do this stuff here. Um, and now if content types e equals options, it means that I want to use the option list. Again, my interface is already prepared for that. I just need to set the, the content and the thing is going to be all right. Now I want to connect to a signal called option selected. This is a signal I exposed in my interface and it's just when you click uh, the option, it's going to send you the option index and then you can use the method choose. So now when talk to green and then green comes and says, hey, do you want blue to go away? Uh, and then you say no, uh, blue stays there. But then, well, if you really want blue to go away, you say yes, uh, blue goes away. Okay, now as the last topic, let me talk about translations and localization. So in Clyde, you can set IDs to, to your lines, so those IDs can be used for translation. It used the Godot's built-in translation support, so I'm gonna show you in a minute. I just created a translation, a translation folder here, and in Godot, any file that's a CSV that follows a format uh, is compiled as a translation, so I'm creating a translation file here. So let me make Mr. Pink say something interesting. Hey, do you want to talk in which language? And yeah, I'll give the option of English Portuguese and the way I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna trigger an event and this event is going to be used in my code to, to set the right locale. This event is just for demonstration, you most likely you won't be changing the, the language from your dialogue, you probably changed beforehand but just to show the thing in action and what I'm gonna do here, I'm adding IDs to my lines and those IDs are going to be matched against the translation file. Sorry, my editor has this really weird plugin that transforms the, the comma into a pipe, but this is a normal CSV file separated by commas. Okay, so now going back to the event callback, let me change this to a match to be more elegant and now I just use the 
So on Relation Server, and I'll change the locale to English when I set English Lang, and I'll change to Portuguese when I set to the, the Portuguese language. As you can see here in my translation directory, uh, Godot generated a compiled translation file. Uh, I need to go to the configuration and add this file to my translation list. So now let me talk to Mr. Pink. So now Mr. Pink is going to say, hey, do you want me to talk in which language? And if you choose Portuguese, now you see the translated uh, version. Um, and that's it. So this is a good way for you to have translations without much effort. You could duplicate the dialog files, you could have one file for each ID, but as I show you, there's a lot of logic in the dialog when you're doing branching and everything, and you probably don't want that thing to be replicated across many files, because otherwise it becomes a mess, it becomes harder to change. So this way you can just set IDs to your files and you can use Godot's built-in translation, what's pretty cool. Unfortunately, for now, you need to create those IDs manually. I intend to create a tool to help with that in the future, like where IDs are going to be uh, generated automatically, or at least like with uh, some level of automation. But for now, you need to manually add the ID and do it. And that's all, actually. As I said, this video was a little bit longer than usual. To finish this video, I want to say thanks to Ennis for pointing out a memory leak in the Clyde plugin and propose solutions for it. Thanks, Dennis, that was really cool. If you enjoyed this video, please leave your like. Consider subscribing to the channel. And as I said before, this plugin is supposed to be a little bit generic in the sense that you can use as you want. So maybe it's not really that friendly for someone that wants like an off-the-shelf solution. So I would suggest to look into other things. If you use Godot, you probably have already heard about uh, Dialogic. And uh, it's still under development, but it seems pretty cool, a lot of uh, options in there. I haven't used it myself, but uh, I have saw the documentation and it looks pretty cool. So as always, the source code is in my GitHub, so you can check the repo. Uh, and if you have any questions or doubts about how to do this thing, you can send me an email or send me a message on Twitter or contact me on GitHub or even comment this video. I'm happy to, to help you. And if you're still here, thanks for watching. See you next time.